it's really my great pleasure to uh, be able to introduce Mark Fraser. Um, please have a seat. Jonathan, Professor, please have a, have a seat and we'll just get started. Um, it's really a great pleasure to be able to introduce Mark Fraser, who uh, we had wonderful uh, good fortune in being able to um, convince to join us at the New School. Uh, Professor Fraser is um, an authority on many subjects, and in particular on matters to do with Chinese labor and social security and pensions, but he has a very broad ranging uh, intellectual ambit, and uh, it's been my good fortune to be able to, to, to really uh, learn how broad it is. I've, I've had some very uh, educational and, uh, uh, and valuable discussions with him already in his stay here. Uh, he and I just returned from a visit to Beijing. In fact, um, Mark was in Delhi as well as in Beijing. I couldn't join the Delhi portion of the, the, the visit. Uh, it's part of a very important and interesting initiative by the India-China Institute at the New School to uh, help to encourage younger scholars, uh, PhD students or recent PhDs in one of the countries who are working on the other or working in some comparative way. And I saw in that context uh, that uh, Mark was able to make excellent methodological as well as substantive contributions to the development of these young scholars. And uh, I expect that he'll do much more of the same here at the New School. The India-China Institute, as many of you know, is really a unique institution uh, which uh, aims to uh, bring about what I like to call the new New School, a different uh, vision for the New School focused on the changing world as a whole. And of course, while cognizant of the inheritances and traditions uh, of the New School really uh, uh, focuses on some of the dramatic changes happening in the world and how they affect the United States uh, and uh, and the world as a whole. Uh, today, uh, Mark is going to speak on the question of who is Xi? And as you know, Xi Jinping, who is the, 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 uh, a, a figure uh, that many of us would like to know more about. And uh, more generally, I think, illuminate the question of the, the, um, uh, the mysteries behind the transitions, transition, political transition in China and the, way, the workings of the the Chinese political leadership and the Chinese political system. Uh, it's really uh, a uh, breathtaking thing to think that the fates of so many people uh, in China, but indeed in the region and in the world, depend on a process which is so non-transparent and uh, uh, indeed for most of us a mystery. So I hope that by the end of this lecture, I at least will know much more than I did at the beginning. Uh, one of the uh, I expect that I will, knowing how much Mark knows about many of these things. One of the great uh, uh, moments during our trip to China was when we shared a trip in the taxi uh, back to the airport, and uh, Mark took a picture of the taxi door, and I didn't understand why he was doing it, and then I understood, he explained to me, and I, I understood that he was um, memorializing this taxi door which had no door handle, because the, uh, the security establishment had asked all the taxi drivers to remove the door handles uh, and um, prevent, thereby prevent um, the passengers from opening the door or indeed pulling down the window to throw out leaflets, which might criticize the party leadership. So he now has this, I think, as a course material and perhaps as a cover for his next book. Maybe we'll be lucky enough that he'll show us this this picture. So without further ado, please join me in uh, warmly welcoming Mark Fraser to the New School and this occasion. Thanks very much, Sanjay, for that introduction and that fond remembrance of our, of our trip uh, from which we just returned uh, on, over the weekend. Uh, I also wanted to uh, say thanks to Ashok Gurung, who is the senior director at the India-China Institute, and to his whole team, much of which is here tonight. Uh, for giving me this opportunity, plus all the very hard work that they did uh, to put this, uh, this event together and this uh, really nice poster uh, together that's all over campus uh, and all over the websites. Um, it's an opportunity for me to offer some uh, broader reflections uh, about uh, Chinese politics at this very important landmark transition that we've heard so much about um, and talk about timing. 
Um, it was a few, I guess about a month ago that Ashok said, uh, hey, you know, why don't we move this up? Because by November 14th, you know, uh, people will be tired of hearing about the Party Congress. And I'm glad that I stuck to my guns to still hold it here tonight because, uh, well, uh, by the time we're finished here at 8 o'clock tonight, more or less, about an hour later, that is to say at 9 o'clock Eastern time, uh, 10 o'clock in the morning uh, Beijing time, the new membership uh, of the Politburo Standing Committee will be rolled out. Uh, I just learned that today, uh, we all did, as we were looking at the news today about the conclusion of the formal Congress and then the start of, of a plenary session of the new Central Committee tomorrow morning. So uh, we will, our timing is great. I thought uh, today about, well, why don't we just uh, scrap the lecture and have a watch party, turn it on CCTV and, and see what happens. Um, but as Sanjay said, we are just back. Uh, I'm back from two weeks in China and India, where we had many conversations uh, about things like corruption, inequality, governance issues, among much else. And I was struck how, at least compared to past visits that I had taken uh, to China, past recent visits especially, how my Chinese colleagues and friends um, were, let's say, much less, much less boastful uh, about the alleged merits of their political uh, system over, say, that of India's. In fact, it was interesting in, in, in China, uh, there was great anxiety about this political status quo and a great dissatisfaction with the status quo, as there was in India. Uh, uh, and in both instances, uh, one saying that the other, that is to say in China, they say, well, our problems are much worse than those in India's, and in India, our problems are much worse than those in China. Um, but there was this great deal of dissatisfaction with the political status quo, and that dissatisfaction uh, is the focus of much of what I will, will talk about tonight. Um, I'd like to begin, though, by sharing with you a story uh, from the days when I was a graduate student in the 1990s, doing uh, research in my dissertation research in the archives of uh, two cities in China, Shanghai and Guangzhou, and local archives in China like anywhere else, um, contain documents and reports and maps, photographs and the like of the city's history. Um, but not like anywhere else, uh, at least not like most places uh, in the world, the local archives in China are administered by uh, the municipal committee, the municipal party committee of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, history and historical research is uh, the purview of the party. And no better reminder of this came one day when I was at uh, the archives and was presented with a rather unusual looking binder of documents. Uh, this binder, like all the others I had, had used up to that point, was stitched down the left side uh, of a spine to hold a stack of loose leaf papers together. But this binder uh, had a considerable portion of the pages in the middle that were folded lengthwise and stitched back into the bind, the, the spine of the binder. Uh, they were literally sewn up and hidden from my view. And when I asked, what was this about? The archivist explained to me that the contents of these pages were off limits, uh, that I, as a foreign researcher, was not allowed to read them because they dealt with a particularly sensitive topic, which was one of several campaigns that the party had conducted in urban areas in the early 1950s uh, soon after taking control, of course, of, of cities like Shanghai and Guangzhou. And the purpose of this particular campaign had been to use mass mobilization tactics to uh, investigate the corrupt activities of, of business establishments in, in the city. Um, and you can imagine what went through my head as I went back to my desk uh, with this uh, stack of censored documents literally in my hands. The archivists who watched over us were, um, uh, well, they were in off at a meeting at some point that afternoon. Um, and I wondered um, what discoveries might lay within these pages. Uh, and if I only had a needle, if I only had some stitching skills, I might you know, uncover something really dramatic. But alas, I had neither a needle nor stitching skills, and so I left well enough alone. Now, I don't know whether uh, local archives in China still operate on this basis, on the. Uh, these, these rules regarding uh, 
uh, the release of documents for researchers. I've heard uh, from recent conversations with graduate students who've gone to uh, local archives in, say, Shanghai, that now everything's digitized. It's very convenient. You go in, you show your passport, uh, they sign you up, you sit down, uh, you look at a, a desktop computer that has all the documents on screen as a PDF, uh, you type in a keyword search and you get your, your, your files, you can print uh, from a local printer, it's all very easy. Well, I suspect that despite this digital transformation of the Shanghai archives, that some documents anyway, anyway remain hidden from view. And now that they no, no longer need to be stitched together, they can simply be uh, you know, erased out of or not show up in a keyword search. Like so much else about uh, Shanghai, uh, it is modern, it is convenient, uh, yet uh, information and politics uh, remain tightly controlled. The party, as we know, still actively manages history, uh, news, educational content, textbooks among them, much, much else, including tonight's topic, uh, politics and policy debates. And I think this image of the stitched up uh, documents that I received at the local archives is an apt one for the study of Chinese politics. What one reads and what one sees and whom one interviews is almost always politically self-selected. Or as a well-connected China watcher once said, uh, describing media coverage of elite politics in China, those who know do not talk. And those who do not know, or those who know very little, well, they do all of the talking to the press. And it may strike you that reading about something that happened as long ago as the 1950s would not constitute a state secret. Um, I was certainly luckier than the US uh, citizen of Chinese heritage who was arrested in the year 2000 and thrown in jail for endangering state security was the charge. This was after he was found uh, collecting and, and copying uh, newspaper articles uh, from local libraries and so forth uh, on the Cultural Revolution. The newspaper clippings were on that subject, that sensitive subject. He was later released thanks to a petition by uh, many scholars around the world to the Chinese government, and I suppose some intervention as well, uh, though I'm not sure about that from US government officials. Now, I don't want to suggest that collecting data, sources, text, and so forth for research on any subject, anywhere, anytime, is an easy thing to do. Uh, all of us who've engaged in research encou have encountered obstacles and disappointments along the way. Nor do I want to suggest that it's impossible to do um, good social science and good historical research in China today. But what I do want to say is that it remains very difficult, if not impossible, to conduct the careful kind of political analysis of the sort that many political scientists do with relative ease elsewhere. They study the positions taken by politicians by reading their speeches, by looking at their voting records, their bill sponsorship, many other possible ways that politicians uh, make their views known or obfuscated at least, but at least we can read them and tease out what kind of policy position they might hold. Now, so much about China, of course, has changed since the 1970s. But in surprising ways, little has changed about and with the study of political elites in China, political leaders. Now, neither Chinese citizens nor analysts of Chinese politics, politics know much about the political views and policy stances of leaders, including Xi Jinping. The lack of information uh, about leaders and the broader secrecy in which Chinese politics operates may not come as a surprise. I mean, I'm not expecting that the Chinese Communist Party, which has obviously traditions of secrecy and traditions of unified political stances or party lines, uh, that it will display the traits of a pluralized partisan political arena. Uh, for better or worse, Chinese politics is not going to ever uh, look like Indian politics or like US politics for that matter. But what I want to do in the remainder of the talk is to show how Xi Jinping at his appointment as General Secretary of the Chinese Communist Party illustrates a serious problem that the party now faces and that the essence of that problem lies 
not with Xi Jinping in particular, but in what Xi Jinping represents and what he represents. You'll hear me use Xi and he almost interchangeably throughout this talk. I'll be trying to talk about the same person, but Xi, he, is in my view a product of a party leadership that is highly risk averse and highly risk evasive of a party leadership that has decided to promote the next generation of top officials on the basis of their administrative competence rather than policy innovation or political skills. Xi Jinping is what uh, I think used to be called um, around here an organization man. And, in, and many people in China are deeply concerned about what his promotion represents uh, for China and its future. Um, as two Chinese scholars wrote in what now seems to be an ominous prediction uh, back in 1999, quote, if within the party there's just a harmonious mood, no dissenting views, no debates, then the party will lose its life force, unquote. So during this talk, I will first provide some biographical information about Xi Jinping, uh, and then turn to what the critic uh, Wang Hui has called depoliticization, and what I refer to more specifically as the party's suppression of political debates by its leaders, or the, the people doing the suppressing more often than not are retired party elders and uh, an elite group of family members with revolutionary heritage related to those uh, party elders. I'll finally talk about how this effort to harmonize or paper over policy differences among its leaders has had the effect of channeling political conflict among elites into the realm of rumor, revelation, and scandal of the sort that we've seen a lot about and heard a lot about in recent months and for much of, of this year. So who is she? I think it's ironic, uh, and maybe in support of my argument, uh, that a very important source of information about the next leader of the world's second largest economy uh, comes from information that was released in 2010 by WikiLeaks, when they released a whole set of uh, diplomatic cables uh, that the US government had passed uh, within its ranks. Among the more revealing details from the cables about Xi Jinping are the following. First, Xi Jinping likes Hollywood World War II movies, such as Saving Private Ryan, because they are, quote, grand and truthful stories of good versus evil. And he wishes more Chinese movies were made with these values in them. He said as much, according to the cables anyway, to the uh, US ambassador during a dinner that they had in 2007. Another cable uh, quotes a teenage friend of Xi's uh, as saying that he is, quote, extremely pragmatic and a realist, driven not by ideology, but by a combination of ambition and self-promotion. And according to this friend, has, uh, quote, had promotion to the center in mind from day one. And the cables also include uh, remarks from an anonymous investment banker uh, saying that she was the most colorless of all the possible successors to Hu Jintao, and therefore, not despite, but therefore, uh, because of this quality of being colorless, uh, he was the most popular choice among the vested interests in the status quo, merely because he would not threaten them, nor would he threaten the status quo. Now, beyond whatever nuggets the US government has gleaned in its uh, internal reporting about Xi Jinping, there are a lot of other biographical details that have been emphasized in recent months in various profiles that have been published in the mainland press, but also, in, of course, in the international press. And uh, among the, the things that I find most important or most revealing are the following. Uh, first, Xi Jinping was sent to the countryside in 1968 uh, at the age of 15, as were many, many of the youth of his generation. Uh, and he, like them, would spend the next seven years uh, doing what was called at the time learning from the peasants. Interestingly, uh, Xi went to the site of the famous base area in Yan'an, in Shanxi province, where his father, uh, in 1935, was the head of a very small battalion based in Yan'an uh, for se several years before. But in 1935, Xi Jinping's father greeted the bedraggled troops, uh, downtrodden troops of, of Mao Zedong, who uh, was at the end of the, long, the very famous uh, Long March. 
another point uh, about Xi Jinping is that uh, in a rather candid interview that was recently published in English, um, but the interview itself took place in 2000, when uh, she was 47 years old, uh, a governor of Fujian province at the time. Uh, this was in a little known Chinese uh, magazine. But he spoke in that interview about his experiences during the Cultural Revolution and this experience in the countryside. And he offered a generally positive reflection of life uh, in the village and the lessons that he learned about plain living and connections uh, with the people. She was also among the first uh, cohort of those who resumed their education uh, beginning in the 1970s. He returned from the countryside, studied chemical engineering at Tsinghua University, apparently without ever receiving a, a formal degree. He did later take an LLD uh, at Tsinghua in Marxist theory and ideological education. That was later on in the 1990s. But he did not, as I once saw reported in Taiwan press, uh, you know, receive two engineering PhDs. I keep seeing this reference to him holding PhDs, but in fact, he does not. She uh, has served in government posts and, and top party posts in provinces such as Fujian, I just mentioned, Zhejiang, and Shanghai, all known, of course, for their dynamic uh, economic performance, not because he came there, they were doing well before, but uh, this is taken by some to mean that he knows how to handle uh, relations with, uh, with private businesses and foreign investors and so forth. Uh, we'll see. Uh, in 2008, Xi Jinping passed a very important test that the party leadership had given him uh, when the Beijing Olympic Games uh, came off more or less uh, without any significant organizational failures. Uh, had, had such failures occurred, who knows, he may have uh, not been uh, rolling out uh, tomorrow morning as the number one leader in the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, many Chinese have come to know Xi Jinping, of course, and, well, until recently. Uh, they have not known him as Xi Jinping, but as the spouse of a very popular uh, folk singer, uh, the famous Li Peng Yuan, uh, sorry, Peng Li Yuan, uh, who is very famous for her singing of revolutionary ballads and for also being something like a major general in the People's Liberation Army musical corps. Some say that the most significant fact about Xi Jinping is that he is the son of the aforementioned uh, commander of the base area in Yan'an at the end of the Long March. Uh, Xi, uh, his father, whose name uh, is, uh, he's passed away, but Xi Zhongxun uh, later became, his father, Xi Zhongxun, later became a very trusted colleague of Deng Xiaoping. And in the 1970s, it was Xi Zhongxun who on Deng's behalf went to Guangdong province and began this very controversial uh, experiment with special economic zones where the you know, very contentious issue of foreign direct investment and hosting uh, foreign direct investment from Taiwan, Hong Kong, and elsewhere uh, took place. Xi Zhongxun was also very closely aligned with uh, a leader by the name of Hu Yaobang. Some of you uh, will know who Hu Yaobang was. But uh, for those of you who don't, he was the uh, deposed part of the party leader who was deposed in 1986 by opponents of reform uh, and uh, who, whose views on education and intellectuals made him very popular with those who would go on three years later to uh, lead and take part in the Tiananmen protests in 1989. And that may sound like a lot to know about a Chinese leader, and no doubt we'll keep hearing more and more about Xi Jinping in coming days as this leadership transition gets consolidated. But the obvious question mark in any portrait of Xi Jinping is where he stands on specific policies, on crucial issues, from ranging from corruption to political reforms to foreign policy. And if we look at his speeches, uh, they are revealing mostly for what's not in them, rather than what he actually says. Here are two recent discussions that illustrate my point about the great confusion over what Xi Jinping's policy stances are and will be. First, Xi Jinping gave a speech on March 16, 2012, this year, obviously, uh, just one day after it was announced that Bo Xilai had been removed as the party secretary of Chongqing, and with it, the many puzzling details uh, of that case. Thank you. Put it down here so it doesn't slide. Um, 
the speech that Xi Jinping gave the day after the, the Boa case uh, uh, you know, was, was opened up with his dismissal, the speech was a detailed explication of something that Xi Jinping called the purity of the party and why this was so important. And in the speech, uh, he said the following, quote, the purity of the party is the basis of the advancement of the party. Its advancement guarantees its purity. The 90 years since the establishment of the, part, uh, uh, of the party proves that the strength and the development of our party lies in a wide variety of sources. The purity of the party has a fundamental influence on the party's innovative capacity, its cohesion, and its ability to fight. When the, party, when the purity of the party is maintained, the more powerful it becomes, the more it can develop. When the purity of the party is weakened, the party's capacity to fight will diminish, and its development will be harmed. Now, there are, uh, to me anyways, a lot of circular <laughs> reasoning going on in that particular passage, uh, but I think it's, it's, it's revealing uh, in many ways about, um, you know, potentially anyway, how Xi Jinping um, would talk about, uh, in a public way at least, uh, the issue of corruption. Um, he did put things much more succinctly in a talk with local officials in Zhejiang province in 2004 when he warned them not to let close friends and family members profit from their connections with officials. And in it, he said, quote, rein in your spouses, children, relatives, friends, and staff, and vow not to use power for personal gain. Now, this quote, uh, interestingly, uh, was also used in a recent Bloomberg investigative story that detailed extensive dealings by Xi's own relatives, amassing hundreds of millions of dollars uh, thanks to their connections to him. So uh, he was not apparently able to rein in the folks he was warning uh, everyone else about in 2004. Um, another uh, speech or, or text that I'd like to, to share with you, the second and final one, is that in September of this year, uh, during Xi Jinping's mysterious two-week disappearance, uh, Reuters and other news outlets were informed by unnamed sources that Xi Jinping had met with a prominent reform advocate uh, named Hu Deping, who is the son of uh, the aforementioned Hu Yaobang. These sources paraphrased to reporters what Xi supposedly had told Hu Deping. Xi Jinping remarked, according to this story, quote, since the people are getting impatient with mere talk about reform, we must raise high the banner of reform, of reform, including political liberalization." Unquote. She had, however, given a speech on September 1st at the opening of the Central Party School in which he said, nothing of the sort. The message in this speech, in a nutshell, could be found in Xi Jinping's remark that, quote, leading cadres at all levels should make unremitting efforts to study theory especially to conscientiously study Deng Xiaoping theory, the important thinking of the three represents, that's a reference to Jiang Zemin, and the scientific development concept, which is a reference to Hu Jintao. Continuing with the quote, they should strive to master the stance, viewpoint, and method of Marxism and enhance their self-conscious adherence to the theoretical and institutional ways of socialism with Chinese characteristics. Now, given the ambiguity over his speeches and other remarks, what can we say about Xi Jinping? While it is difficult to find much coherence to Xi's political profile, we still see many commentators reading into Xi's views what they want to project onto China and its future. Optimists see him as the leader who will bring about political or long needed political reforms to China. Pessimists, of course, uh, see otherwise. I think the most important part to understand, point to understand about Xi Jinping is that he represents a generation of party leaders who were born, of course, after the 1949 revolution, who came into positions of power in the government and in the party, just as the reforms were getting started in 1979. And they have mastered the skill and the art of advancing in a system that rewards mediocrity and punishes those who would debate personnel questions or policy issues uh, decided by uh, the, the party elders. As one outspoken liberal advocate of political reform observed, quote, now our politicians are all bureaucrats who've risen through the ranks. 
To put it simply, they're more mediocre. They're not leaders, but they just follow policy. Those who are sharp and independent-minded will be eliminated by the system, and the most obedient ones, the ones without edges, will get promoted. This is the quote that made it onto the poster, if you're looking closely. Um, we could call this pattern what the China scholar, uh, Bruce Gilley, has termed the end of politics, or what Wang Hui has described, uh, and discussed, as I mentioned earlier, under the notion or the concept of depoliticization. Regardless of how we label it, it refers to the decline in political competition or contestation among elites. Now, please note, it does not mean uh, a decline in elite conflict. If anything, conflict intensifies as factions scramble over the, the really valuable uh, uh, amount of money that can be made with these personnel appointments and the patronage that can come with these personnel appointments. What I'm referring to is, is a decline in political debates over policies and, over, and a decline in competition over visions to guide the future of China. That is what is being suppressed. Now, I have three points to make about this suppression of political debates among uh, uh, China's current leaders. And the first point is that it was not always this way. Obviously, Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping both have had vast written records and actions that allowed us to know their personalities and policy stances and to see clearly who in the party advanced policies that were at odds with what Mao wanted to do and what Deng Xiaoping wanted to do. Now, Mao and Deng are admittedly not a fair comparison. Uh, but what has happened since 1989 is that the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party power brokers, uh, usually members of the outgoing Politburo Standing Committee, uh, have appointed a succession of leaders to the top post based not on what they've said or what they've advocated, but on basic competence and on factional affiliation. Uh, Jiang Zemin, who uh, took the general secretary post in 1989 amidst the Tiananmen crisis, uh, and Hu Jintao, who took the top post in 2002, were also mysteries in terms of who, what they would espouse and what issues they would seek to address. They were both incidentally hand-selected by Deng Xiaoping, uh, and Xi Jinping will thus be the first party secretary who was not explicitly uh, given the blessing of a paramount leader, unless you want to count Jiang Zemin as a paramount leader, which is something of a stretch. When we talk about the number one post in an authoritarian government, I think it's easy to assume that it is a very, very powerful position. But in fact, the post is not nearly as powerful uh, as, or let's say that it has just as many constraints uh, as that of, say, the US president. Uh, today's general secretary is a first among equals. The leadership is no longer individual but collective and held together by a commitment to preserve the status quo to keep policy differences under wraps. And it was not always this way. In the 1980s, Deng Xiaoping and the leadership cohort were pushing through dramatic economic reforms as well as political reforms. They were not openly contesting over policy in the media and so forth, but it was quite clear from their speeches and other public appearances uh, who was on which side of a domestic or even foreign policy question. I think we can trace this decline in contestation uh, to the year 1992. That was when Deng Xiaoping formulated a slogan that in Chinese is Bu Zheng Lun. Now, Ezra Vogel, in his biography of Deng Xiaoping, uh, translated this as, um, let's avoid quarrels, which sounds rather mild and, and not very assertive. But I think the term could be more accurately translated as, don't argue. Deng Xiaoping issued this command, don't argue, in several speeches that he gave on the now very famous Southern Tour, as it was called, in uh, early 1992. This was his final legacy before his death uh, five years later. And re regarding the quite serious divisions over policy at the time, and especially over how to introduce important reforms to labor uh, and industry, Deng Xiaoping said, quote, don't argue. Arguing merely complicates things and wastes time. Arguing means we'd not be able to do anything." Close quote. This may be an argument you have heard in other contexts 
stop arguing, and let's get something done. Now, in broader historical perspective, of course, Deng was very effective and deserves credit for turning down the hyper-politicized environment uh, of the Cultural Revolution when everything was political. But now, the success in removing political debate has led to an anti-politics approach that produces a highly apathetic and also antagonistic view of politics. When you ask many ordinary Chinese about the leadership transition, basically they could care less. Uh, whenever I'm in China and, and have a chance to talk to people about this issue, most of them uh, use the common reply of, we don't care anymore, uh, they're all the same, the only people that do seem to care are, are you, uh, uh, you know, foreign scholars who say you pay attention to Chinese politics. Now this stance against politics also gives rise to an elite promotion strategy to refuse to engage in political debate or propose solutions. Instead, the hope of, of, of people like Xi Jinping is administer a city or a province, hope and pray that nothing goes wrong. There's no environmental disaster. There's no uh, other sort of calamity that would, uh, I would be held accountable for. And they get promoted based on competence. And it leaves an entire cohort of risk-oriented, status quo-oriented technocrats uh, as the leadership. Now, there is a, a counter argument here, and it's an important one that I want to address. And that is that, hey, you know, it could be worse. Um, elite cohesion and consensus was difficult for the party to achieve for many decades. And, you know, what about the fact that there have been two peaceful transitions in power, assuming everything goes well in the next five or six hours, um, that one happened in 2002 and one happened uh, now in 2012? There have been retirement ages introduced, forced retirement ages, uh, which is, after all, the, the, the reason why seven out of the nine members of the Politburo Standing Committee have to step down uh, uh, this time and be replaced by those under age 68. Uh, term limits have been introduced. This is why Hu Jintao is stepping down after two five-year terms. So there is an important norm and, and rule following that, that's been established, and I think you could say this is worth something. But the reason that these reforms were introduced back in the 1980s was to prevent succession crises and elite splits of the sort that had been tearing the party up during the Mao era. Now, during that period, there were debates over policy issues uh, that often got branded as two-line struggles. The victors in these struggles would purge and arrest uh, and even extinguish the losers. And so these political reforms that Deng introduced were a good idea at the time. Um, so that some of these practices would dampen conflict and give greater authority to the political office rather than, say, just the informal authority uh, uh, and reduce some of the power of uh, retired CCP leaders. My point is that now you have the opposite problem. Politicians are rewarded for capable administration and silent conformity rather than bold ideas and policy solutions. This brings me to the second point that the conformity I'm talking about is a recipe for stagnation and policy paralysis at a time when China very much needs policy innovation. And with the exception of a few noteworthy declarations by Hu Jintao and, and Wang Jiabao, the outgoing party secretary and president, of course, and the premier, Wang Jiabao, regardless of, a, I mean, uh, with the exception of a few of their statements, uh, we really have no idea what the leaders of China's stances are on very important issues that China faces. If you take the demographic and aging crisis, which some say is a slow motion unfolding disaster in the making, and therefore uh, it brings up the obvious question of should the one, the so-called one-child policy, birth, uh, or say the population planning policy more accurately, uh, should that be revised or even abolished? Uh, we haven't heard anything about it from the leaders of China. And I, I would be surprised, frankly, if we heard Xi Jinping make a speech uh, coming out with a political a policy stance on this subject. Uh, what about the issue of citizenship for migrant workers in urban areas? And the uh, obvious question is maybe we should abolish the household registry system that kind of creates this, this two class, uh, classes of citizenship, uh, one for urban residents and one for uh, rural people. 
Uh, no speeches, no policy declarations from any of the leaders on this, nor have we heard anything about uh, environmental calamities, food safety scandals, all, yes, noted as problems and noted uh, in terms of a crisis response when they happen, but uh, no one promising uh, or promoting or advocating bold measures to cope with them. The policy failures of the past decade have spurred a lot of very recent uh, and very bold criticism from uh, the ranks of, of intellectuals in China. There was a deputy editor of a prestigious party journal who issued recently, or at least in August of this year, a blistering critique of the past 10 years. It, his, his critique was uh, posted on the website of the magazine Tsai Jing. Uh, according to the author, the most urgent issue to be addressed, quote, is that the party, while leading the people towards being moderately well off, failed in this process to solve the increasingly serious corruption and the ever-widening gap between rich and poor as well as satisfying the needs of the populace for effective social integration and for power to be returned to the people. This has resulted in the party facing a legitimacy crisis. You can see why this statement was removed about two or three hours after it was posted to the Tsai Jing website. Now, as I've, I've also suggested, we might forgive Xi Jinping and many of his generation for assuming that the end of politics and, the, and a Stymieing of political debate is a good thing, given what they went through uh, as teenagers or you know, young adults uh, during the Mao era when they had their political socialization. But to me, the 24-7 hyper-politicized environment of the Mao era versus uh, the utter absence or near absence of politics in the current era you know, represents a false choice. One can have political debates. One can do so with relative transparency uh, in China uh, without this leading to an elite split. Uh, with, with the caution that always comes with looking elsewhere for examples, um, one could point to Mexico under the PRI, the party that led Mexico for so many generations, so many decades anyway, uh, having done this uh, with a kind of one party, two or three factions uh, system uh, arrangement that lasted it fairly well. Uh, and there are other places, Singapore is another possible example, albeit, uh, you know, given the scale, uh, maybe a comparison that one should make with great caution. Um, Robert Dahl, the political scientist, of course, called this uh, pattern of political competition among elites many years ago one of competitive oligarchy, and it was a very important uh, dimension in his analysis of, of politics. Now, some say that China and its leaders, whether we're talking about the emperors or the Communist Party or the Nationalist Party, have always preferred to operate in secret, behind the view of pub the public and especially behind the view of foreigners. The party indeed has an obsession with secrecy and a practice of stifling debate, but in my view, in the somewhat checkered 60-year uh, history of the party's governing China, the most politically dysfunctional periods have been those in which political debate was suppressed. Conversely, the periods when leaders could engage in modest debate over policy choices, I'm thinking of the 1950s before the Great Leap Forward and the 1980s, these were periods that saw great advances in both governance and development in China. Even Mao Zedong in his famous speech on the correct handling of contradictions among the people in 1957 uh, said, the, uh, pointed to the importance of debate, and ironically, this speech was itself suppressed, not allowed to be published for seven or eight months until it finally came out in the summer of 1957. Someone as powerful as Mao couldn't get published uh, at that time. He said, uh, uh, albeit in, 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 in the quote I'll read, he, he'll refer to correct ideas, so he has in mind that there are correct and incorrect ideas, but he said, quote, you may ban the expression of wrong ideas, but the ideas will still be there. On the other hand, if correct ideas are pampered in hothouses and never exposed to the elements and immunized against disease, they will win not win out against erroneous ideas. Therefore, it is only by employing the method of discussion and criticism and reasoning that we can really foster correct ideas and overcome wrong ones, and that we can really settle issues." Close quote. Now, the political stagnation that I'm describing creates the environment for precisely what I predicted uh, would happen in China. I predicted this a few years ago, uh, 
uh, that we would see the rise of populist leaders who attempted to circumvent the gridlock uh, at the top to go around the wishes of party insiders and shake things up by appealing to the public with a populist message. This leads me to my third and final point about the suppression of politics, and that is that political conflict still goes on, but it takes the form of the bizarre, the scandalous, and the mysterious, and we needn't look far for examples. For the first half of September of this year, Xi Jinping, as you may remember, disappeared from public view for two weeks. The question at that time was not, who is she, but where is she? At one point, what might be generously called a citizen journalist website based here in the U.S., Bo Xun, uh, reported on its website that Xi Jinping and the head of China's anti-corruption agency had both been involved in separate automobile accidents in what was an apparent assassination attempt on the two of them on the same night. Even Bo Xun known for publishing anything and everything, remove that item a few hours after posting it. She was also rumored at this time to have suffered a stroke uh, or some ailment that prevented him from appearing in public. He finally did reappear in mid-September, but not after this episode had done considerable damage uh, to uh, how both people in China look at their political leaders as well as how, you know, in some ways the global public uh, looks at and thinks about uh, and perceives uh, how politics in China operate. Um, the other case, of course, uh, which uh, shows the rise of populism as well as the rise of this scandalous and bizarre and, and, and kind of tabloid sorts of, of, of reporting on politics is the case of Bo Xilai. And just to refresh uh, your memory uh, on this case, it was in February, February 6th of this year, that the deputy police chief of the city of Chongqing showed up at the U.S. consulate in Chengdu with a large load of documents. We still don't know what was in them. But after 24 hours in the consulate, uh, he was released to the security bureau in China and escorted uh, to Beijing. On March 14th, uh, the Chinese premier at his annual press conference with reporters following the National People's Congress, the legislative session, uh, made a shocking criticism of, of Bo Xilai with a reference to the Cultural Revolution. He said something to the effect, the premier did, uh, that our friends in Chongqing must learn some lessons, uh, must draw some lessons from uh, what China went through during the Cultural Revolution. A day later, uh, Bo Xilai, it was announced, had been removed as party secretary of Chongqing on the Ides of March, as some people noted, uh, placed under investigation, and his wife, Gu Kailai, uh, was under investigation for the murder of a British business person some months earlier, uh, in late 2011. The Chinese blogosphere was alight with rumors a few days later uh, that gunshots were going, were going on, in Beijing, military units seem to be moving around the city, and again, uh, suggestions of, of something going on in the way of assassinations, or more likely a suggested uh, a possible coup attempt. Later this summer, at the trial of Gu Kailai, uh, there were featured uh, tales of kidnap, extortion, poisoning, and of course the rampant speculation that it wasn't Gu Kailai herself who was standing in the dock, but some kind of body double, uh, a rather heavier body double than that, and uh, again, fueling this, this question of, of, of what on earth is going on with this case. There are so many more unexplained puzzles. But I raise that here tonight, uh, not the murder, but his political rise and fall, uh, to say that it's a perfect example of what one gets uh, when one suppresses the natural tendency towards politics. Now, Bo is, or maybe we should say Bo was, uh, the consummate politician uh, who sought to fulfill his ambitions by engaging in politics as the party chief in Chongqing, and which gave him great de a great deal of popularity. He spent vast sums on public housing, uh, and, and I think many in China, I would be uh, among them, many who've looked at this, would regard it as, as good investments in public housing. He spent a great deal on payments for land to, to farmers who are actually migrant workers in a kind of land exchange. Uh, he did invoke a soft nostalgia for the Mao period by invoking revolutionary songs and so forth. 
Uh, he also invoked a very successful crackdown on organized crime in the city. It had been discovered soon after he got there that the police force was largely in cahoots with several organized crime groups in the city. And uh, he did use many extrajudicial tactics to uh, bring these uh, organized crime leaders and the rank and file down. But uh, despite that, uh, maybe because of it, he remains in Chongqing, extremely popular. And as, as our visit to China uh, last week showed, he also remains uh, highly regarded by many outside of Chongqing and the rest of China. They view this as a, a political case and not at all a, as a legal case. But in the end, what really got the leaders of China, uh, uh, what really riled the leaders of China uh, about Bo Xilai was not none of these policies so much as it was the fact that he was basically openly campaigning for a seat on the Politburo Standing Committee. What they didn't like and what they couldn't stand for was his policy style, not so much his, his substance. And it's for this reason, I think, that these policies uh, that, were, that were launched in Chongqing, even before he got there, are likely uh, to continue because they're impor an important part of, of reducing inequality in China. Another far less noticed casualty of this suppression of politics, and we may find this out in a few hours, is an individual by the name of Wang Yang, who is the uh, uh, party secretary of Guangdong province, uh, who in fact preceded Bo Xilai as the party secretary of the city of Chongqing. Wang is also a politician who seemed to be promoting his own set of policies uh, uh, and political status in a much more liberal kind of liberal or neoliberal sort of approach to, to uh, policies, but he made some very important statements um, that I wouldn't regard necessarily as neoliberal about uh, labor rights and union organizing. He intervened in several strikes on the side of workers and uh, was also, again, sus suspected of playing politics and trying to get a seat on the Politburo Standing Committee. I think. Again, it, we, we won't know until a little bit later whether he is indeed, has indeed been left off the list for the Politburo Standing Committee, but if he is not included and he hasn't been showing up on any of the recent lists that have been uh, uh, published in various media outlets, uh, that I won't be surprised uh, if it remains the case that Wang Yang, because again, he was a politician like Bo Xilai, was uh, not included in the final Politburo Standing Committee list. By way of conclusion then, I want to say uh, a few things about um, Chinese politics today and the issue of political reform. Everyone commenting on Chinese politics says political reform is very important and much needed. But this can become um, circular or, or tautological. And in other words, solving political problems necessitates political reforms in China. But it's never clear which reforms are needed, uh, are most needed, and in what sequence. To me, the reforms that are most needed are those that open the space for political debate, letting politicians be politicians. And I'm cautiously optimistic that despite the current serious legitimacy problem that the party faces, that it can make these necessary adjustments to revive political debate among its leaders. This does not require the usual package of, of recommendations, which you hear largely from Americans, which is that Oh, they need competitive elections, they need opposition parties, they need a free press, they need uh, lots of other things that are presumed to be the essence of political reform and um, good governance uh, uh, here, uh, and, and in some ways are being imposed and recommended on, on China. As I noted earlier, this was something, or the, these modest reforms uh, that I'm suggesting uh, are, is something that the party has already practiced as, as uh, party elites debated policies in the 1950s and in the 1980s. Uh, these are, as I mentioned, the two decades that many in China remember positively, uh, and not coincidentally, these are the decades that had relatively balanced growth and rising living standards uh, for broad segments of the population. So how would the party open this space up for leadership, for debate um, over its policies? Many people point out the, the good uh, uh, caution or risk that this would lead to a split in the party because once you, would, once you have a perceived elite division, this uh, has in the past uh, 
uh, been an invitation for mass protests to take place. Uh, others along the same lines say that the Chinese Communist Party can never overcome you know, the culture of Leninism in which members are supposed to fall in line behind a leadership, a leadership decision. But we should not overlook the numerous venues that already exist in China for political debate to take place. I'm thinking here of the National People's Congress, the legislature, which I mentioned earlier. There's also a, a group of eight, uh, maybe more, uh, non-communist political parties that are organized into something called the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, which no one can remember in Chinese or in English, but it's basically this, this informal uh, uh, body of non-communist political parties um, that have a long history dating back even to the 1940s, but that the party, the Chinese Communist Party, has allowed to exist and survive. It's currently very much regarded as kind of window dressing, but it is, I think, a potential very important forum for political debate. Local people's congresses, local legislatures at provincial and municipal levels also provide another important uh, arena for uh, policy debate to take place. There's another uh, now extinct institution, but it could be revived, known as the Central Advisory Commission, which Deng Xiaoping started in the 1980s to uh, move people who were being forced to retire into that commission so that they would have some place to go to during the day and some, some job to pretend like they could be doing. But it provided at that time uh, an important forum for debating policies that were uh, uh, being considered back in the 1980s. Deng Xiaoping shut it down in the early 1990s. And I think that the most likely case for why the party, why I'm cautiously optimistic that the party will do something like this, uh, to reintroduce policy debates, is because uh, they're already taking place with great intensity uh, in Chinese society, outside the state, among public intellectuals, uh, among social media, among think tanks, and, and lots of other venues. And it seems to me the party, again, in its own crass personal interest, would want to uh, co-opt these debates, bring them into formal institutional settings so as to manage them more easily. Um, and if the party and its leaders do not acknowledge these debates by openly discussing them, uh, the party will continue to look like it is out of touch by offering slogans instead of debating ideas and continue to lose legitimacy at a very critical moment. Finally, let me anticipate uh, one or more of your questions by now offering a thought on where China is headed, what, what's, what's going to happen in the future. Um, and I always at this point like to caution against the tendency towards teleology, to assume that China is in some kind of transition. A large group of China watchers, professional and otherwise, uh, you've heard them, um, look at the evidence and say China's on the transition to market capitalism and democracy of some form. An equally large group of analysts uh, who are influential, maybe not as, as large as the, the, the ones uh, who are saying that China is in transition to a market democracy, a, a liberal capitalist democracy, but this group looks at the same evidence to conclude the opposite, that China is on the path to becoming uh, you know, the superpower, super authoritarian threat to you know, the, the, the US and, and the rest of the world. A small group of influential scholars also says, a third group, that China is on the verge of collapse. Um, what all of these views have in common, of course, is they make really good headlines. They're very clear in their, their predictions, and they offer a simple path to a future China. Now, my views are the sort that never show up in headlines. I think it's because uh, I, I think that my views are the most likely and least sensational scenario, uh, but the reason my views don't show up in the headlines is because it's something like the status quo will not change very much, a rather bland prediction, but a one I think that is, is the most probable to happen. What I mean by the status quo will not change very much is that a co Chinese Communist Party leadership is going to continue to grapple with all sorts of governance problems, like lots of other countries in the world, uh, but will make sufficient adjustments to uh, stay ahead of things, to keep corruption from spiraling completely out of control, to keep inequality at manageable levels through rural development and other anti-poverty programs that have already introduced, uh, and to prevent the worst kinds of environmental disasters, uh, and so forth. Uh, despite the seriousness of the charges I've laid out here about the absence of political contestation, I do think that a new form of limited political contestation will reemerge um, because, again, it is not entirely new to the party in its long history 
and the institutions are already in place to have these policy debates take place. Um, and I think the reemergence of the policy debates is not likely to lead to the elite splits, because whatever policy differences do exist, the basic consensus among party leaders is to preserve the dominance of the party and to pursue the continued expansion of China's wealth and power. And we're not having the kinds of, of, of deep ideological divisions almost that we saw in the party uh, in, in the earlier periods, say in the 50s and 60s. So my main closing message is that we need to pull ourselves away from the tendency to get lulled into teleology that China's heading along a path towards some terminal destination point. Um, if you consider the fact that China has been transitioning uh, away from a planned economy for longer than it was a planned economy. This is, this is you know, for, it was a planned economy for 25 or so years, and now it's in a post planned economy or a transitional economy, this is, this is obviously something's wrong if the transition is longer than the original state you were in. Um, so if we dispense with transitology, see China, uh, we see a China that looks like many other countries that we pay attention to. It's beset by many problems. It isn't addressing these problems as well as it should, uh, but it is doing something. And it appears quite capable, I think, of muddling through without collapsing without transforming itself into a liberal democracy or an authoritarian superpower. Thank you very much. I, can, I think I can handle the, the questions. I hope I can handle the questions here and uh, just keep an eye on the time uh, and numbers. Um, and I'm afraid that I don't know uh, lots of people's names here, but let me just... Uh, try to write down things I go as I go, and uh, we'll start here with you, sir. Context of that, of course, was uh, during the 50s. That was right after the, uh, you know, the, the founding of the People's Republic, yes. uh, where the economy was pretty much collapsed. Right. So there was, in the sense that there was more of a consensus within the leadership about what needs to be done at the time, and also following the in the in the 80s, of course, was following the, uh, you know, the you know, the the d disastrous Cultural Revolution again. The that everything was, you know, was was in shambles. So so then there was more or less a, a, a general consensus within the leadership in terms of what needs to be done. And also the, the, the other side of this is that, you know, during both periods, ironically, they were, you know, supreme leaders who were the arbit ar arbitrators, right, sort of of the, mm -hmm. of the dispute if should they arrive. So in the first case, it was Mao. Uh, before, uh, before, you know, before the, you know, the, uh, the, the Great Leap Forward took place. And, of course, in the... Uh, in the in the 80s, there was done before he shut down the contestation, you know, and the and the debate. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. so I, I wonder, I wonder, sort of. So, if if you were making the point that um, that yes, in the in the in the Communist Party history, there was you know there were those periods that those were were allowed, and now, um, and and then going forward, I guess there, the, the the possibility that yes, there might be another crisis which might provoke the uh, the op more open political discussion, but then without the um, the sort of the, the 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 luxury or or the the, the presence of a supreme leader who can then be right. arbit who, who can then you know sort of be be the uh, sort of arbiter of the of the debate. I wonder whether how how that would factor into your you know prognostic you know. Okay. Yeah. Um, if I might respond to these one by one, I think I'll remember the, the essence of the questions better. Um, so I, I would, um, not sure I would completely agree that the, the 50s and the 80s uh, were a period of strong consensus about what needed to be done. Yes, there was uh, this notion of having just come out of a difficult period and that uh, something needed to be done. But you still had in the 50s, you know, these very vigorous debates over should we adopt the Soviet model uh, or others who said, you know, that's the opposite of what, and they're the ones who eventually emerged victorious, that, that we need to not have this vertically oriented planned economy uh, adopted from the, the Soviet, Soviet Union, but instead a more decentralized, more spontaneous, more uh, localized kinds of, 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 
economic policy and domestic policy that would, uh, you know, do what Mao really wanted to, to have done. In the 80s, uh, yes, we need to, uh, th there was consensus about moving out of the Cultural Revolution and moving out of the, uh, you know, cult of personality or whatever we want to call uh, Mao's leadership style. But there was still very strong disagreement over, yes, we, we, we all agree China needs to prosper, but there were debates over um, and a lack of consensus over what economic policies would be uh, most needed. Now, to your point about uh, the supreme leaders who could come in and arbitrate uh, and step in and make a decision to, um, you know, stop debate and, and move ahead with a particular policy, uh, th this is something that obviously uh, would be absent in, in if the if things evolved as the way that I predict and the way I, I guess I, I hope too, uh, that uh, you would have political debates, but I think that rather than a rather than a supreme leader who has to stifle debate or bring it to an end um, and and forge a new consensus, I think that some of the institutional developments that have taken place would allow for there to be uh, sufficient um, protections against things falling completely apart. Uh, that that you would you would have uh, a policy debate. Uh, you would obviously need to bring it to an end somehow. Uh, it, this could be done, it, and this could be a mechanism by which something like um, voting within a, a, a legislature on a particular policy could be done because they know that there is no, uh, you know, person on a horse coming in to, to, uh, to settle the debate. And, and that, that, wouldn't be, uh, that wouldn't be such a bad thing, I think, in, in the eyes of, of many, um, including especially, I mean, our conversations last week in China, I remember asking someone, uh, I said, well, what is it that, that you that really you think is most needed? Is it just, uh, and he said, well, it's just um, media coverage of the Politburo meeting where they're going to select the leaders. Let people stand up and say, hello, 24 colleagues. Um, this is why I want to be one of the seven people on the Politburo Standing Committee. And if you put me on the Politburo Standing Committee, I promise that I will do the following policies. I mean, who knows if they'll live by those promises, but at least the, the, the nation could see this debate and could, um, uh, I think, have a greater sense that, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot more transparency in how this process is going on and to see what policy issues uh, are being talked about. And of course, it would give the people in the Politburo the incentive to uh, uh, knowing that they were uh, at least, you know, if they weren't being televised live, that, that, that the transcripts or, or uh, portions of this would be videotaped and they would be able to speak in this way uh, to the public um, in ways that have never happened before in, in many, many senses. Thanks for the question. Okay, I see Lily's hand, yeah. Um, why do you want to strengthen the party and the state? Why, why not allow or recognize mm -hmm. or um, uh, acknowledge the democratization of politics in Chinese society overall? Why monopolize political power in the party and the state? I mean, isn't it a good thing for uh, the party to become just a um, source of bland, competent administrators um, and have uh, populist leaders in society bring up the issues that people are really concerned with and have the um, people in government respond to these populist leaders? Because if you have all of this contestation within the party state itself, it's very dangerous. And um, I, the country is too big to sustain that kind of contestation, which is idealized in the West as debate. I mean, we just went through a presidential season here. How much of a debate did we have that was really transparent, that um, gave insight into how government really works. Um, billions of dollars were spent for what? So, you know, I question the premise that quote unquote transparency requires public debate. And I question the premise that that has to occur within the party state as opposed to a relationship between party and society or state and society. Mm -hmm. Um, I think uh, that's, a, that's a really good question. I think that the first part of it, um, 
I want to say that st strengthening the state, as you put it, um, doesn't have to come at the expense of society, that a, um, a, a party and state that is more responsive to um, outside groups uh, and inputs from society and more uh, incentivized to uh, communicate policies to the, the public and to society uh, it results in a stronger governance, stronger party, but also a stronger society, a more, uh, uh, you know, power is uh, diffused uh, in ways that it hasn't been before, that it's not under this highly transparent uh, system, that information is more widely available and shared. Um, to your second uh, point about um, the problematic, I think would, would be the way to put it, uh, premise that transparency requires public debate and, you know, is this idealized and this really happen anywhere? Of course, as I was working on this, I kept thinking, yeah, I mean, obviously, we have, there's a huge problem in U.S. politics uh, and somebody like Wang Hui, uh, when he talks about depoliticization, um, says this is not just China. This is, the title of his article is The End of Politics or Depoliticization East and West. So he's talking about almost a global phenomenon uh, in which, uh, for various reasons having to do with global capitalism and neoliberalism, that polit political debate has been stifled. But I, like he, uh, are, am hopeful that uh, politics can be recaptured from the Maybe not. In, I'm not hopeful about America, but I'm, I'm hopeful that politics in China can be recaptured from this state of depoliticization um, in ways that, uh, to go back to the, uh, the, the my earlier point, that um, social organizations and and problems like inequality and corruption uh, can be addressed in a better way than they than they are than they are now. Um, let's go to this side of the room and uh, Carl. Thanks so much. I really enjoyed the talk, and I particularly like your con the, the argument you're making about depoliticization. That seems to me exactly the, the right trend over Jiang, over Hu, and now potentially moving into Xi. And I tend to agree with you that sort of at the end of the day, the one thing that'll, that'll push Chinese leaders to open up, bring politics back in, is if they are believe that addressing these types of disputes within a system, within elite or political institutions is better than having them addressed on the street. So I think that, but to put that aside, sometimes in the media you hear these uh, ideas advanced that there are secular trans transformations going on as you move from third generation to fourth generation to fifth generation of Chinese leaders that might lead to significant changes in politics in China. Here are three examples. One, some people assert that this generation, Xi's generation, because they experienced the Cultural Revolution when they were younger, they're more likely to feel the need for reform of some kind. Two, this generation, it's alleged, has a different educational background from the past. These are no longer all engineers, some people having studied post-1978 law, other subjects, that might shift their outlook. Three, some people say, this generation of leaders is the, is the group that has had more exposure to the West at an, a slightly you know, earlier point in their life. Xi Jinping, in fact, his own daughter, actually at Harvard under an assumed name, uh, and so forth and so on. So might those trends shift Chinese politics going forward? Yeah, this is a, an argument that one hears a lot about, and uh, it was stunned at the statistic I saw about this central committee, or I guess the outgoing central committee. Um, uh, no, it wasn't the central committee. It was the whole uh, uh, party congress uh, being 90% holding college degrees uh, of the 2,200 some odd uh, members, which, um, yes, could potentially represent um, different approaches to problems than, say, 20 or 30 years ago when only five or 10 percent of the National Party Congress had college degrees. But I, on the other hand, worry that um, this enhancement in the educational profile and the experience of the West and sending one's daughter to Harvard uh, only is a reflection of the highly uh, elitist and maybe out of touch. This, this uh, 
further insulates uh, the party elite um, in ways that uh, are just as serious as some of the problems I, I've pointed out here. Um, so it remains to be seen whether this generation, um, I mean, one day there'll be a generation coming into power who never experienced the Mao period. They will have only been um, post-79 uh, cohort. And uh, it's not necessarily the case that they'll have um, a more positive or more capable uh, outlook in dealing with the problems uh, of, of China, whatever those might be at that time. So I guess I'm one who is a little skeptical about putting too much weight on structural changes like this of, of generational um, profiles, demographics, and, and this kind of thing. Um, yes. Well, here comes the mic. According to Sijirbao, Wang Yang is not, according to Sijirbao, if they can be believed, Wang Yang did not get on the standing committee, but he's still on the Politburo. He's still on the Politburo. Okay, <laughs> we have the hot off the presses here. I saw you hold the newspaper up as I was My talking. My question yes. to you is, Given what I've heard from several people, I assume that you will agree that Xi Jinping is not likely to reevaluate Tiananmen. I'm just curious as to what your take on that would be. Not likely to uh, evaluate by which you mean um, you know, reverse the verdicts, uh, have an investigation. Um, yeah, I, I would agree. Yes, I would say not, not likely uh, at all. Um, uh, I saw when I was in China watching the, the opening of the, the, the Congress, there was, there was Li Peng televised in one of the audience shots, and uh, that was the first thing that occurred to me. And then thinking the television producer has been told to <laughs> put, put Li Peng and Jiang Zemin and other retired people uh, onto the audience shot list as, as the speech is being read. Um, so I, uh, you know, again, this is something I, I wish would happen, but I, I don't see that it, it would happen where they would come back and say, that this was all, um, you know, what it was instead of this counter-revolutionary riot or whatever it's, the verdict was that was passed down. Um, yes, in the front, uh-huh. Yeah, um, there is something about the fact that China is restarting itself as a country since Mao, and uh, it's a very large country, Lily, I think, mentioned. Uh, there's all this variety. Um, and the question that I have is, it seems as if they have major problems to deal with that we no longer are able to deal with at all because we have a divided Congress, we have a, a president that seems not able to speak as well as he used to. And um, there is... Uh, the sense that the problems that we have to deal with, which China is aware of, I believe, like climate change, are things that require a government that can just say, we're going to do this, we're going to move into this, we're going to change this. And one thing I have always believed, I may be wrong, but I've always believed about the Chinese governmental people is that they come in with a Confucian ethic, that they believe they have a responsibility and they think about what that responsibility is. Now, that's always been my thought, and I don't know whether you agree that they have that sense of responsibility and that Confucian ethic guiding them. Um, I'm not sure uh, exactly what is meant by Confucian ethic, but, I mean, there certainly is in, in you, you know... You your mind and you have a responsibility. Okay, a and... Uh, I think the other part of that is that, uh, yeah, you have a responsibility, and if you, f if you fail in that responsibility, if disasters happen across the land, you have this mandate uh, of, of being lost and the notion of rebellion being justified, uh, which I think is an important part of it's more mentioned maybe than Confucian. But um, I, I don't want to impose too much of the you know, cultural uh, perspective or traditions on this. I think it is important to not assume that you know, rationality and rational choice is guiding the, the behavior of, of decision makers in China. Um, but in terms of specifics of tackling a problem, you know, here's a problem, how do we solve it? Um, I think that it, it's easy to exaggerate the ability of, of a Chinese Communist Party or uh, an emperor or whatever in, in uh, a setting in China, in a 
authoritarian setting to say, oh, I'm going to do that. I, I can do this because I don't have to go to Congress and I don't have to have my uh, policies uh, subjected to, you know, constitutional review by the courts. Those checks and balances do not exist, of course, but um, there are many, many other obstacles uh, to a decision maker in China saying we're going to reduce emissions, for example, because it's important. Um, local governments that are dependent on uh, employment and revenues from industry are going to resist that tooth and nail, and they do uh, already. Um, special interests, large state-owned corporations in the energy, and telecommunications, coal mining, et cetera, all of these special interests are going to resist tooth and nail, uh, even if it's managed to be enacted as a you know, major document. Uh, very, very difficult. So there's a lot of resistance, a lot of veto players, uh, even in the, the Chinese context. And it's way too easy to exaggerate. Um, you know, I, I remember the Tom Friedman column saying, oh, I wish America could be China for a, t for a day, and then we would suddenly uh, turn all of our efforts to sustainable energy. Um, that that uh, is, you know, reveals quite a, an important misunderstanding of how policy and policy implementation works uh, in, in China. It, it's, it's difficult there, very difficult there, too. Okay, uh, Niti? Uh, Mark, I'd like to thank you for an absolutely fascinating talk. I learned a lot from it. Greatly appreciate it. Thanks. My question is not, is, is actually, uh, may seem a little naive. Um, in your presentation, where is the politics and, wh and, and what is the politics? So for instance, um, it would seem the Chinese party uh, at the moment uh, is technocratic, uh, yet there is a certain optimism you have that that can change due to almost a sort of an embedded tradition of disputation that has existed in the past. Um, so I'm sort of curious where the politics is in the Chinese party in that sense. Mm -hmm. At the same time, what is the politics there for? For instance, if Bo Xilai um, was able to offer some modest redistribution through, for instance, the uh, land valuation scheme he had, offer some restitution for rural migrant labor, mm -hmm. is it so important whether he also created a space for disputation and discussion? Or is it more important that he actually identified, let's say, uh, sort of a claim for redistribution we can all believe in? If that's the case, if it's the latter, that it's the claim for redistribution, is it really politics that's important here or a sort of a political position that, that we, we agree on? Um, so that's, that's a part. What I'm, I think, ultimately moving towards is to sort of ask you to clarify why politics is important. From a mm -hmm. liberal notion, politics is important because disputation is important. That's how we create the sort of vibrancy of a democratic state. Uh, if we see China as an example that makes us question uh, our pithy understanding of states and democracy, what is the exact notion of politics that's useful here? Is it to do with disputation? Is it to do with something, something else? Thank you. OK, thank you. That's, that's a, also an excellent question. Um, the, the politics uh, in terms of if this were to be liberalized uh, or opened, I should say more accurately, um, what political constellations would, it, would exist? I mean, that's another way of, of kind of thinking about this question. Uh, it, it's hard to tell, but at least um, we, we know that by some people's analysis, there are these, these factions in which one is called the princeling faction or the elitist faction, generally more uh, pro-growth, especially growth that redounds to monopolies and, and, uh, and other groups, um, versus a second or co competing faction of sometimes called populists uh, associated with Hu Jintao and the, the party school. Uh, I sometimes think that that two-faction uh, rendering is, is way too uh, simplistic because, well, you mentioned him, Bo Xilai. He's both a princeling and a populist. Uh, and so I think it's much more fluid than that. Um, but, you know, generally speaking, I think that uh, in terms of domestic policy, let's say, uh, that one could imagine uh, two kinds of, of 
policy coalitions, one that is more redistributive, um, that is more um, focused on the interior areas and the rural areas, uh, enhancing their livelihood, of imposing something like an income tax to redistribute and pay for those programs, versus a, a coalition that is, um, you know, at the margins, um, liberal in terms of economic policy, pro-market in terms of economic policy, at the margins because uh, when it comes to challenging powerful monopolies through entrance by foreign companies or by private Chinese entrepreneurs, uh, they're opposed to that, but a more uh, status quo kind of, of, of politics stance, a political stance. Um, but you know, the reason I, I didn't go into great detail on that is because uh, limits of time and I wanted to uh, really talk first about, you know, the, the issue of, of why political debate was important. I think that, that's also part of your question, and it, it's, uh, it needs to be further clarified. But I think even just from a practical but maybe also normative position, that debate um, and deliberation in a, in a political community is really important because uh, otherwise uh, people feel excluded from a decision and when uh, debates are held and deliberation occurs, uh, I think that from the practical standpoint, you get better informed public policy um, and better decision making, uh, but you also get, once the policies made and the decision is made, is that uh, the, the implementation and the buy-in is generally there uh, because people have had a chance to have their voices heard and are able to, uh, um, having been involved in the, in the, the d deliberation over the issue, are able to uh, comply with and, and, and implement the, the decision uh, once, it is, once it is made. Um, this obviously uh, has some limitations. Uh, when it's a 51 to 49 kind of outcome, then, uh, you know, and, and if, if positions are highly polarized and there's not much of a center, then this just becomes a forum for arguing and then you go home and you don't make those better informed decisions. So my, my argument presumes that there is some middle ground of, of, of persuadable people who will be informed by the debate and will, the policy choices that emerge from it will be uh, better than if there weren't a, a debate that was held, if there, there were just five people deciding for the, for the whole group. Okay, yes. This may be a follow-up on that, okay. but, but less profound and from a very layman's point of view. Um, why should they insist on calling themselves communist anymore? How much communism is there? And even mm -hmm. the, in the society at large, it is capitalism. Capitalist activity is going on, of course, crudely, in a crude form. Uh, even symbols are disappearing. For example, during my brief stay there, at Tiananmen Square, I saw the huge portrait of Mao mm -hmm. and things like that. But one night I was taking a, that cruise, night cruise, uh, in that Shanghai River, famous river, I forget the name. Uh -huh. And all that I saw around was this advertisement, neon lights, neon advertisements of multinational corporation, most of them US-based. I was the thought that went through my mind that was a very small, not even a picture of, not even a, yeah. a poster of Mao around. What happened <laughs> to the communist society? Maoism is dead, that's what I'm trying to say. So if you can okay. <laughs> elaborate um, on that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, this is a, a question that, that comes up uh, lots and lots of time um, and in classes too, uh, where students uh, will rightly uh, scratch their head and say, what is communist about the Communist Party? And I guess um, you know, it, 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 the best way to address this is to say that um, socialism is still very important as an ideology. I think socialism is still very important uh, in Chinese politics today, among the leadership and among the public, that uh, it's not a socialist planned economy, but the idea of socialism in terms of a, a system that uh, transfers wealth, that uh, um, imposes, or is supposed to impose redistribu redistributive policies, uh, that, that some of the critique of the current inequality and economic uh, 
direction of the country is that uh, we have we have moved way towards uh, uh, too too much towards capitalism. I was talking with a a, a fairly well known uh, foreign policy analyst in China whose name I won't reveal, but I, when we were talking about the U.S. election, which had not yet been held, he said, "Oh." Romney would be better for China. I don't personally like him, but he would be better for China because he's more capitalist, and China is more capitalist now. So you see, if you have a capitalist country and a more capitalist-looking president than Obama, this will be good for China. Uh, so you know there is the same thing you're pointing out, uh, uh, which is that what has happened uh, to the Communist Party or to socialism in China, but I, I think the fact that it's controversial uh, the fact that people uh, don't want to have a purely market capitalist economy uh, in China uh, suggests that, uh, that you know, maybe social democracy uh, of the sort. Uh, I have another colleague who, who's done a lot of research on Scandinavian countries and social democracies of, of northern and western Europe, especially northern Europe, and who says that um, he's also been tasked with the idea of possibly changing the name or coming up with new labels for the party. So it's not the Chinese Communist Party, but the Chinese Socialist Party or the Social Democratic Party. So this is the real direction. And I, I, w I wouldn't say that um, ideologically, uh, public opinion uh, at the mass level, at the elite level, is um, highly in favor of uh, market practices and market-based uh, distributions of, of resources, uh, that there is a, a lot of resistance uh, to that, like there is a lot of resistance in other places to that. Uh, the, the Shanghai Bund, of course, is the famous venue for, this is the river bank you're talking about, the famous venue for all of these um, foreign corporations who've operated in China going back to the 1850s, and now you see them in, in Pudong with the, the uh, I mean, on the opposite side is the 19th century buildings, and on the uh, other side, on the Pudong side, are the, the 21st century buildings. So it's always been this kind of spectacle of, of foreign capital. That, that is located there, and not surprisingly why, uh, it's a tourist attraction. It, it's, it's also highly unrepresentative of the rest of China, where you don't see those foreign corporations, and, and you don't see uh, certainly that level of, of architecture and, and uh, neon and so forth. Yes, behind. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that great talk. Um, my name is Sarah Miles, and my question is around um, what I perceive from reading the press and just talking to people to be an actual debate going on, and whether it's within the Politburo or the, mm -hmm. you know, where it is, but in the elites, about economic policy specifically, that there actually is an argument going on about whether or not to. Uh, you know, denationalize some of the state-owned enterprises um, to make more room for private enterprise, to change the way the bank op the central bank operates, because this is all the government, right? right? Let people earn more interest on their savings deposits so they actually could have more wealth, um, you know, do things to give people more options other than real estate, um, you know, that there really is an economic policy debate going on. And I'm wondering, when you when you talk about policy, I was wondering what you exactly meant by that, because at least in that area, you know, not elections, um, right. but, but, you know, how China manages to grow going forward. Um, and certainly, I think, th from what I read, the Chinese government does believe that it has to promote a more consumptionist and less export-dominated economy. Now, obviously, you've got the elites who are bought into this because they make money off the state-owned enterprises, right? So that will be right. obviously an obstacle to this kind of reform. But that kind of reform, it is my impression they actually are debating. And I'm wondering what you think about that. Yes, I, I think that um, is an important area of what I was talking about when I said that there's an intense debate going on in society, that a lot of these debates about economic policy and rebalancing towards a more consumption-driven economy uh, are, are taking place among think tanks and scholars uh, who come up with different policy recommendations in various essays and reports and so forth. But uh, where it, it seems to stop uh, is among the ranks of the, the, of the leaders where, I mean, yes, they'll say we need to rebalance, but they don't really uh, come out with any particular stance 
saying that that one of these is is uh, one of these is what we want to do. One of these is not what we want to do. Or this part of the, for example, uh, in the um, when I was there in China talking to someone uh, about this issue, of, uh, I said, "So, do you think that within the Politburo Standing Committee, the nine of them, do they have uh, debates over things like this?" And, and uh, he said, "Yes, I think in the Politburo Standing Committee, they have." They have some debates, but especially over, over the direction of economic policy, that, that they're not restrained in doing this. Of course, it's in private. They're not allowed, they don't publicly uh, argue over policy. And then I said, okay, what about within the 25-member Politburo? He said, oh, they, they, no, they're completely um, silent. They, they don't even debate economic policy in that forum because they're afraid of whom they might offend and they want to get promoted to the Politburo Standing Committee, so they'll they'll keep quiet. Um, and this is uh, the kind of thing that I'm talking about. But um, what, what I would, I guess, like to see would be that um, people in the Politburo publicly come out and say, all right, we need to denationalize the state-owned enterprises, or we, do, we need to have an income tax, or we need to uh, adopt other kinds of, of reforms. And, and this is what I want to kind of make my political brand about as a, as a politician. Uh, that we, we don't see, but, but that we could see, um, especially, especially if China were to uh, continue to slow down economically and face the kind of, of crisis that would lead uh, for there to be greater pressure on uh, these ideas to be picked up. There are a lot of ideas out there, but they can't be picked up uh, yet by leading, leading politicians. Uh, there was a, 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 a report that came out, uh, Reese, well, earlier this year, um, issued by a team of World Bank people as well as the State Council's development, uh, uh, State Council, Deve the Development Research Council, the think tank of the State Council, um, China's cabinet. And uh, I think it was <laughs> revealing that um, the, the as the deadline approached for this jointly authored report to be uh, released, that uh, it finally came out uh, on the on the, the day uh, that the deadline for the report was was supposed to to uh, the, the, the the day of the report that it was supposed to be issued. But what happened was that um, in the the front page of the report it said um, this report is being issued only in English now. It is still under uh, draft form in Chinese, and so. Uh, the Chinese side, the, the Development Research Council of the, the State Council, uh, was still arguing over the text and the language of it, but the World Bank people dragged it out anyway. So there was, in, in other words, a kind of paralysis going on, even on the, uh, the, the think tank side, over what recommendations to put into this report that was supposedly jointly authored uh, with the World, World Bank. Um, okay, back over to this side. Um, Go to Sanjay first, then Jonathan and Andrew. Thank you very much, uh, Mark, for that very r informative and rich talk. I wanted to ask you if you could comment a bit more on the choice of, as it were, management strategies of the uh, Chinese uh, state. I mean, I, I don't think the right lens to think about democracy is only instrumentally and only in, in terms of the uh, consequences that it brings about. But that is one lens with which to think about mm -hmm. democracy, and an important one. And it's quite clear that one of the things that democracy does is that it, and I understand, of course, that democracy is an incomplete concept. There can be many different forms that democracy takes. But in its different forms, one of the things that it helps to do is to, is to clarify what the interests are, how intense those interests are, and some of the ways in which they can be potentially aggregated and in which various kinds of, as it were, solutions can be brokered which, uh, which, uh, which, which, which uh, diminish the extent uh, of the discontent in the society. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, despite being an imperfect instrument, it, uh, it, 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 this, this is, this, uh, one could argue that this is one of its strengths. Now, there are other ways of fight identifying what the interests are, and of course in China, uh, there are some such mechanisms, the mechanism of petitioning the central government, for example, which seems to work for, or not work, for particularly intense uh, kinds of discontent. Uh, and we also know that, to borrow a phrase which Hart and Negri made uh, 
popular recently, though I believe it's, it's Deleuze came up with it. The Chinese state goes down to the ganglia. I mean, it's the Maoist state in particular was famous for going down to the, the ganglia, ganglia of the society, yeah. for having all sorts of information gathering mechanisms. And some of that worked to identify uh, for the benefit of the leadership exactly mm -hmm. what mattered and what was taking place. Though, of course, there were also instances of spectacular failure, most notably, as Amartya Sen points out, the failure to convey to the top leadership the extent of the production disaster during the Great Leap Famine, which in turn yes. led a uh, great leap forward, which in turn led to famine on most accounts, though that also is controversial. So uh, d does the Chinese leadership have an understanding, in your view, and whether or not it does have an understanding of this trade-off, how do you think this trade-off is being or could be uh, managed? And I use the word managed, of course, mm -hmm. conscious that, again, that's not the only, only thing to value. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I think um, that at one level, the Chinese leadership uh, you know, proclaims explicitly uh, Western-style democracy is not for us. And sometimes they say American-style democracy is not for us, which means it could mean uh, you know, a, pr a presidential system as opposed to a parliamentary system, uh, that uh, the, the separation of powers and the, the things you get with an American-style democracy um, are not appropriate. But just as often you hear uh, that Western-style democracy is not, uh, but, th but that suggests that uh, there could be non-Western-style democracies as a possibility. And of course, they always say, uh, we have democracy already in China. We have democracy going back to um, you know, things uh, like the mass line, the, the ganglia you're talking about, part of that was to, in the Maoist era, to uh, learn what the masses uh, wanted and to then, after some deliberation, uh, take the policy to the masses as if they had uh, been really involved in, in making of, of the policy. But um, the, the point you bring up about re uh, petitions and some of the other remarks you made brought up in my mind um, the issue of, of representation and so uh, how do um, groups within society, as well as individuals within society, um, have their preferences and, and uh, wishes and basic material interests even represented in politics? And are there mechanisms that uh, exist currently or could exist in the Chinese uh, context without some radical change in the status quo to represent uh, social interests? And this is where we could get into a long discussion about corporatism and, and uh, organizations that are sponsored by the government but have some autonomy from it uh, that would aggregate interests and then bring them into a political arena. And I think, um, again, I may be too optimistic here, but I think that the kinds of political reforms that would allow for there to be debate and would allow for more space and would help invigorate some of the social uh, organizations in China uh, could lead to a, a, a sort of politics of representation uh, that would um, enhance the uh, capabilities of the government to respond to things that people want. So pluralism, uh, of course you run the risk of some groups being more powerful than others as you always risk in, in uh, pluralism and pluralist politics, but it does seem to me to be not way far-fetched uh, as a possible political future uh, for China, and, and one that I wouldn't be surprised if leaders in China were uh, considering at, at the present time. Okay, I think Jonathan and then Andrew, and then we're pretty close to <laughs> the, the hour. Close to eight o'clock. Thank you so much, Mark. That was really fascinating. Um, uh, in the Chinese transition, as with the American election, foreign policy really takes a back seat. Um, domestic issues are paramount. Um, but I was curious about uh, your take on Xi uh, and this other question, and the question about muddling through as it comes to China's relation with the rest of the world, since one area where things seem to be changing and significantly enough to wonder what what it would mean to continue the old policies is uh, as China becomes more and more oriented towards its own consumption, of course, it's more and more dependent on energy and other issues from other par parts of the world. Uh, and recently, you've seen, uh, of course, a lot of saber rattling uh, 
vis-a-vis uh, -vis Vietnam, Philippines, Japan, um, and, uh, and uh, uh, an ongoing debate, which might be settled in a few hours, about whether uh, Hu Jintao is going to uh, stick around as the head yes. of the military or let Xi uh, take over. Um, so all of this kind of makes me wonder, is muddling through possible for China's foreign policy? Yes, um, I mean, the, I think the most pressing uh, question on that at the present time is this d dispute um, with Japan over these, these islands, if we want to call them that. Um, and is it the case that um, there's some coordinated uh, crisis being generated uh, by the, the leadership in order to distract domestic attention from everyday concerns? Is it that kind of, of, of thing going on? Uh, or is it uh, the military uh, pushing the envelope and doing things that civilian leaders, uh, even the Politburo Standing Committee, never wanted them to do and is not comfortable with, with them doing in terms of you know, patrol vessels and, and things like this being sent to the islands? Um, one, we, we don't know, of course, but uh, the fact that we don't know, the fact that um, the, uh, the very constrained way in which any political leader can talk about foreign policy is a huge problem. Uh, and this is not, um, this, this may be related to what I'm talking about, is that you have to follow the, the you know, if you, can, if you ask to talk about it, you have to follow a specific set of party line talking points which would mean that in talking about the Diaoyu Islands, that uh, these are China's, they've always been China's, and uh, we will do anything, including using force, to uh, bring them back to the motherland. Uh, you know, th this uh, is, is dangerous rhetoric. And I think that um, if, if we see uh, uh, the kinds of political reforms that I've been talking about tonight, then, uh, you know, it would allow for there to be more than just one position that one can hold in the highly sensitive realm of, of foreign policy and foreign policy preferences. Um, but the real wild card will be um, where the military uh, stands in all this, and will they, uh, going back to the economy questions, will they, uh, the economy continue to generate the kinds of resources to give the military the uh, increased budgetary expenditures year upon year upon year? It reaches a time where that becomes uh, impossible, uh, then the military is going to be very unhappy. And, uh, you know, it could really uh, begin to, uh, or maybe continue to throw its weight around uh, in civilian uh, policy matters. Uh, so uh, we'll see. Hu Jintao, whether he's on this Central Military Commission, stays on it, or whether Xi Jinping is allowed to come back on, allowed to, to start from the get-go uh, as the chair of it. Uh, is something, of course, that will, will come out in the next day or two. Um, I guess one possible uh, compromise would be that Hu Jintao uh, steps down, but he gets to have his people, his generals, uh, the ones who were close to him, sit as commissioners on the Central Military Commission and kind of, he can have the seat or at least exercise authority without holding uh, the seat is a possibility. Andrew? I essentially have the same question, but I can just make an extension on that question, I suppose. I've read a lot in the newspapers that Xi's connection to the military is one of his strengths or why he's um, considered a yeah. great candidate. And I'm wondering how that uh, plays to this whole military question. First, what is his connection to the military, or if you could elaborate that at all? And if he has a strong connection, how would that sort of influence the direction that the military would be pursuing policies mm -hmm. or how their their interaction with the, the rest of the government. Yeah. Um, so, so the military connection is that um, back in the early 1980s when he was, when she, he was just first starting out uh, the, the political career, uh, his, his father I suppose, uh, but his connections helped him receive an appointment as the political secretary for a very highly ranked general by the name of Gung Biao. And that uh, military leader um, employed Xi Jinping as political secretary for, two, I guess, two years. It wasn't a long stint. 
But it was long enough to, people think, allow Xi Jinping to establish some network of, of uh, connections with the uh, military establishment in China. Now, um, it, it's easy to make too much of that. It, it could be the case that uh, the military people with whom he established professional connections at that time, who are now in positions of power, will uh, tell him what to do. <laughs> Conversely, it could be the case that he tells them uh, what to do. Uh, so I think it's easy to exaggerate uh, that that experience will somehow allow him to have authority over or influence from uh, military on foreign policy and other uh, international uh, relations matters. Um, so uh, I think, you know, had he been in longer service, or had he been, um, had other deeper ties with the military, you know, maybe there's something that we could, we could make of this. But it's not all that unusual for, I mean, Hu Jintao did not have it, but it's not all that unusual for, um, let's put it this way, uh, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao and Xi Jinping, all three of those leaders in succession, have come into the top civilian office having not very strong ties uh, with the military, and this has led, at least in the early years, um, especially with Jiang Zemin, to uh, problems in that the military felt like that they needed to exert authority to, to show uh, the civilian leader um, who was in charge or who, how much authority it, the military had in some foreign policy making. So we had the Taiwan crisis in 1995 and 96, largely over this effort to show Jiang Zemin uh, what kind of uh, policy preferences and what kind of actions the, the, the PLA wanted to take and that he was forced into the position of, of um, complying with their, their preferences. Uh, will that happen with Xi Jinping? Um, you know, l keeping an eye on this crisis with Japan uh, in the early months uh, of this new administration will be very, very important and we'll see uh, how much authority the civilian side has and the military side has. And of course, it will still be, even then, largely a guess, unfortunately. And that may be the way to conclude <laughs> our discussion tonight of Chinese politics, largely a guess. Thank you.